Thank you. Uh, so yes, my name is Larry Platt, uh, and I'm an editor, writer, and most recently co-founded with uh, A.J. Raju, uh, The Philadelphia Citizen, which is an online platform that is attempting to disrupt uh, uh, journalism as we know it, to practice solutions journalism and combine it with bold calls for civic action. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan. Um, and, but that is only one of the innovations in democracy in the American city where it was born. Uh, and so you'll see these videos, they don't feel like typical philanthropy and then we'll talk about the philosophy behind them. One is the overall mission video and one is the most recent germination project uh, video. At this point, let me uh, uh, introduce you to uh, the, the Philadelphia's most innovative mutant, uh, A.J. Raju. So, A.J., uh, let, before, I want to get to all of the branches of the Raju Foundation tree, but before we do that, uh, take us back to that bar that we were in five years ago and paint the vision for what you think the role of philanthropy ought to be in terms of reinvigorating an entire city. I, th I think Frank Islam uh, summed it up, uh, the idea behind uh, both purposeful philanthropy and uh, I think the idea is to be a venture philanthropy that doesn't just uh, serve as a uh, grant-making philanthropy but uh, instead creates new ideas that can be incubated and uh, that once you plant the seed, it grows into a new ecosystem where people can then run with it. Uh, why? Let's talk a little bit about those videos yeah. because they don't seem like, they seem more like an Apple commercial than a typical philan philanthropy message. So, so what is the thinking behind that kind of messaging? I, I think the idea, look, there's so many people here who are based on just pure passion and created um, uh, meaningful organizations that both move the needle for people that desperately need help, uh, but also capture the imagination of those who want to do good with their lives. But nonprofits often are um, handcuffed by the notion that they have to be frugal in, in how they present themselves. I don't have that boundary. Uh, you know, I, uh, the videos that are created are not paid by the foundation. Uh, they're not paid by uh, the Germination Project. They're paid by me personally. Um, and I can act like Apple if I needed to. And the reason for that is, um, you know, my branding philosophy or strategy is to whisper in people's ear while they're sleeping so when you wake up it becomes your dream. And I don't believe in the idea that we can create revolutions or to stand on a podium and tell people that this is the right thing to do. All we can do is awaken in people's hearts what they already believe. And uh, if you tell the story and the narrative, and then if you resonate with people who are already inclined to, uh, to join you in a journey of, I don't want to use the word philanthropy, of service, if you will, uh, then you have a much more of an effective thing Sorry about that. Uh, you have a much more of an effective opportunity to make an impact because now, now you're recruiting like-minded people. Look, you don't need uh, to take a hill. You don't need a thousand people who have never touched a gun before. You just need 12 snipers. So you identify the best and the brightest and then you climb that hill. So in that way, you're a, you're a motivator for change. You're trying to start a movement. Look, I, I, I I'm not trying to be self-deprecating, but I've, I've very limited talents. I can't build things. I can't do anything else. So, I, my strength has been to, and which are uh, which are really blessed strengths. One is to have a vision to see beyond the horizon and have a native curiosity for uh, what's around the horizon. Connect the dots. Second is to tell an effective narrative that um, resonates with a handful of people where they want to run and explore what's beyond the horizon. The third is to identify true leaders with whom we can run. 
Uh, and then my job is to merely be a cheerleader sitting on the sidelines and watch the people on the field uh, do their part. So let's put some meat on these bones. Uh, let's talk about the various branches of the Raju Foundation. Uh, one I touched on, which is the one that we co-founded, the Philadelphia Citizen, which is a media organization that tries to, to um, activate change through solutions journalism. But, but that's not all the, <laughs> that the Raju may Foundation I, may, I, may I, on sure. just on the, look, one of, uh, Venki gave a great introduction for Larry, but Larry is one of our top journalists in, in Philadelphia. Uh, in addition to having a like-minded uh, spirit about what journalism ought to be, um, we're blessed to have somebody of Larry's stature, best-selling author for at least four books, Alan Iverson, um, the book on Stuart Scott, Jamie Moyer. Uh, and he's working on a fantastic book right now on uh, John um, uh, Dornbos, um, uh, the, the, uh, the long snapper for the Philadelphia Eagles. A fantastic story when it comes out. It'll be a bestseller, guaranteed. Uh, he's now a... Um, resident magician for Alan's show, but, but he, you, you've seen him in America's Most Talent, et cetera. An amazing backstory of, uh, uh, may, I, may I at least tell the basics? Sure. Um, uh, father who at age 12 killed his mother and how that impacted his life, life of both forgiveness as well as how he became a magician and introverted life. It's an amazing story, but Larry is an example of somebody you know, you, once you have a good idea, you need somebody of Larry's stature and to take that idea, because ideas are cheap. I come up with tons of ideas, they're cheap. It's execution that is expensive. And it, it, without someone like Larry, the Philadelphia Citizen would not be what, what the Philadelphia Citizen is. So I'm happy to take credit for it. That's my career, taking credit for other people's work. But, but, but Larry truly is a, a, an unbelievable journalist and we're honored to have him here. I wanted to make sure that we provided a proper context to Larry's presence here. But let me, I, let me, thank you. Thank you. Let me also talk I'm about I'm going to hire him as my agent. Let me, let me also talk about the citizen for a second. I fundamentally believe, and Asif and I have had this conversation before, that journalism should be a nonprofit. It should be the province uh, of society, no differently than, uh, no, just like an art museum or an orchestra, et cetera. That the foundation is up to. So I'm just going to ask you to tell us briefly uh, what they all are. And let's, let's start with germination project and 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 you know to put my cards on the table here when you first told me about the germination project you remember I was skeptical and I am fully prepared to admit how wrong I was so tell us what it is and then uh, I'll, I'll I'll throw in what my skepticism was well let me as a as a uh, back up a bit the foundation's mission is a pretty bold and audacious mission, which is to make Philadelphia a global force in policy, commerce, and culture. It is not a short-term vision. It is intentionally designed to be a long-term outlook. And Germination Project is what I would call a 50-year bet. In short strokes, it's to identify the best in talent at the 10th grade level, train them to be civic-minded as well as be good in their uh, chosen profession, and then lastly, to retain them for Philadelphia's good by making sure that they come back and, and serve their professional career as well as their philanthropy and service within Philadelphia. Why do we do it? If you think about Philadelphia, at one point it was Mecca. That's where uh, all great change, whether it's policy, commerce, culture, everything happened in Philadelphia. Along the way, as the video suggested, we lost that prominence to other cities. Silicon Valley is a perfect example. Out of trees, they have created a multi-trillion dollar economy. Uh, and anything that is disruptive in the world originates out of Silicon Valley. But if you look at Philadelphia, we have the great richness of universities and hospitals. The number one medical college in the country, Penn Medicine, is located there. The number one business school in the country, Wharton, is located there. The number one children's hospital in the country, CHOP, is located there. Not to mention Temple, Drexel, and so many others, Swarthmore, Har Haverford, and others. And then when you look at arts and culture, Philadelphia is ranked among the top five cities in the world when it comes to arts and culture. It's Philadelphia, New York, Vienna, Paris, London. Fourth largest collection of art, Philadelphia Museum of Art. Largest collection of Renoirs, Philadelphia Museum of Art. Largest collection of Duchamp's, Philadelphia Museum of Art. 
the largest post-impressionist works in the world, the Barnes Collection, uh, is, is in Philadelphia within walking distance. Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And I can keep going on, the Constitution Center, the Revolutionary Museum, et cetera, et cetera. So we have these great institutional riches, but we also have the other side. It's a tale of two cities. 26% of our population lives below the poverty line. Among all big cities, we have the largest amount of child poverty. Um, if you look at all major statistics that we are concerned with, that you have spent a lifetime in the nonprofit sector and philanthropy addressing, Philadelphia ranks high, unfortunately, with bad distinction. So while one side is flying high, there is also a responsibility to make sure that those who are grounded in poverty, those who are grounded in social issues can also be lifted. And the Germination Project is an attempt to sort of identify those heroes who will do well, who will become the next Mark Zuckerberg, but then also along the way will have the sense of civic commitment uh, to not only solve Philadelphia's problem, by extension of their genius, solve humanity's problem. And that's the, the, the key, right? I mean, my initial skepticism was the Germination Project was going to uh, uh, find the best and the brightest in 10th grade. This last class, 42 applicants, 17 were selected. Of those who were not selected, their GPAs were 4.2. So that goes to your best and brightest point. But I was skeptical at first because I said, well, AJ, these kids are going to be fine. They're not the ones who need your help. And to which you said, and then, and then sort of demonstrated over the last three years, to whom much is given, much is required. And this trains the best and the brightest in realizing that there's a world that they need to serve beyond their own self-interest. Well, I think it's also getting exposure to it. So for example, we have done a healthcare initiative. Uh, so the idea behind the Germination Project is once we select them, once you become a fellow, you become a fellow for life. Um, as long as you work in the Philadelphia area, you can go away from college, but then you must work there. Uh, one of the initiatives we have, in addition to the training, Wharton is a partner, so we have a Wharton boot camp, and Wharton does more, all of the leadership incubator. Uh, uh, the Penn Medicine, CHOP, Temple, Drexel, all of the major institutions locally are partners with the Germination Project now. But the other side of the coin is the service initiative. Uh, on the healthcare side, let's take a typical student like Dean Manko. So Dean Manko, uh, who's now at Stanford uh, from our first class, uh, skipped first year Stanford classes because he took uh, a standardized test over there to, uh, to skip the first year courses. So that type of a talent and that level. On the healthcare side, he worked with Dr. Lorraine Icavetti at Jefferson uh, on the cure for ALS. You will say, what, what does a 10th grader or 11th grader have to do with a small lab with, on ALS finding the edge of curiosity for medical innovation? Well, have you ever seen LeBron James play basketball at 10th grade? It's no different. If you talk to Dean Manko, you're talking to somebody who's a research scientist at the, at the level of you know, the doctors who are sitting here. Uh, it's capturing and sparking an imagination in, in, in Dean's mind, not at that level, whether he should be the next Dr. June, find the cure for leukemia, but also on the other side, with our partnership with the American Heart Association. We have a challenge where we're teaching 10,000 people in low-income neighborhood CPR. Our germination fellows, along with the American Heart Association, are spearheading that effort. We just bought a kiosk, which is, uh, uh, is installed in Philadelphia, making our city the second city in the country to have a self-standing kiosk that teaches CPR. Um, our students are lobbying Harrisburg to make Pennsylvania the 27th state to make CPR a high school graduation requirement. They are working with think tanks to find disparity in health. From that think tank came the Wellness Exchange, which we're going to launch uh, in January, which will be a thousand people pilot program involving Penn Madison and Wharton as our uh, academic partners uh, to do a real wellness improvement where they participate in a one year program where they engage in wellness and for similar to American Express or Discover Card, they earn reward points for losing weight or to improving their wealth wellness, which they can monetize in terms of reward points and, and, and others. And that has captured- And this interest. is in low income neighborhoods. This will be in the heart of North Philadelphia, which is one of the uh, poorest uh, uh, counties in the country and in a, in a city as rich as Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, so, so you touched on the wellness exchange. Tell me about Int Exchange. What is that? Oh, well, you know, I have a modest collection of Indian art, and one of the things I noticed was uh, the people who 
uh, collect Indian art, especially out of India, are the who's who. Um, you know, many of them well known to um, an audience of, uh, of, of this heritage. And I also noticed, getting to know them uh, through these art, art boondoggles, was that their view of Philadelphia was limited to their arrival at the Philadelphia International Airport and the car ride to Wharton and back. And that's not the greatest drive, by the way, if those of you who have done that. That's not Philadelphia. That's one portion of Philadelphia, but it is not the complete picture of Philadelphia. So, as you know, I'm a big cheerleader for Philadelphia. I owe it a lot. Uh, and I would start selling them Philadelphia. But they would always talk about New York, MoMA, Met, and not talk about the Barnes and others. So what started off as, I want to get these guys to come to Philadelphia, to see the city through my eyes. And one day I was watching the Academy Awards, uh, and I had an aha moment. I said, we will be the Academy. We will be the arbiter of good taste in South Asian art. I'm a trustee at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, called up Timothy Rubb, and said, every year we will announce who the top South Asian artist is. The museum and the foundation will do that. By doing so, we'll become the Academy. And this will be an annual event where we invite the top artists. The first year it was Atul Dodia, second year was Jitish Kalat, last year was Ranjini Shatar, and the fourth artist right now we haven't announced, but we know who it is. Um, and you want to break some news here? No, we don't. <laughs> uh, and, and the reason was, the premise was not to honor Indian artists, but it was to create a trade route between Philadelphia and India using arts and culture as the new spice. And the logic was, if we can use art as the honey or the magnet, we can attract the big bees and the bears, uh, the likes of Karen Nathers and Shiv Nathers and others who are into art. But then, then through art, they will now see a region for its richness, like Penn Medicine and all the other things that we talked about. And the punchline is we have now six companies that have located in Philadelphia. Uh, Powerhouse Ventures, I think um, Asif knows them um, from Bangalore. They are now beginning to invest and have co-investment dialogue with us from our side. The logic was to create jobs, not just to promote art. Of course, art uh, uh, is also a good thing, but, but it was an excuse to create a trade route between the two regions and uh, the early Philadelphia because it is my new adopted home and I'm loyal to it. But also, I think Philadelphia uniquely made who I am. Um, I've always walked on the sunny side of the street, and I've told you that before. And even on rainy days, I've had people running to me and to my side with umbrellas. So, and that, I don't think would have happened if I lived in or landed in any other place, even in, within Philadelphia. It was Northeast Philadelphia. I was Mowgli, who dropped in the jungle of Polish, Irish, and, and the Italian uh, municipal workers. And it was that life back in the 80s which looked and resembled a lot like the, in the movies, if you watched it back in the 80s, it was like America, you know, where every door was open, every mother was your mother, you know, you could walk in. And, and it was in that womb of love and acceptance that I uh, uh, experienced America. It is not the same story for every other immigrant. I know that I'm blessed and it's been a unique perspective. And it is for that reason that I'm, I'm, I'm loyal to it, is because of the great welcome that I received. And, and, and I've always um, only seen, regardless of how short I really am, I've only seen through people's shoulders because people have always lent me that, with that perspective. And, and it, it, it is that, not to sound corny or to not to sound overly self-deprecating in that sense, but um, my life has been uh, no different than Forrest Gump in many ways. And it's, uh, um, it's been a blessed life, and I think we want to give back to Philly. Uh, another uh, aspect of the Foundation's work um, that maybe you want to touch on is the uh, uh, Millennial World Affairs Council. Uh, tell us about that. Uh, you know, that's probably one area that we don't do as much. That is become, um, I, I think I said in the beginning, we're not a grant-making foundation, but what we are is a a foundation that incubates and creates an idea. Once it creates it, puts a new leadership and lets it release. But the World Affairs Council's Millennial Program is named after us and, and we write a check. And uh, our initial intention was also to do more than write a check, but to curate opportunities for millennials to become more global in mindset. So that they're not thinking just about the myopia of what Philadelphia is, but also what's happening in India and Bangladesh and other parts of the world. Um, 
so that they think like global citizens. Uh, we're probably going to phase out, this is news, uh, we're going to phase out the World Affairs Council's Millennium Program. It has been great, we've been very happy with the work that they have done, but we're going to replace it with the Wellness Exchange, which we're launching in January. And the, the, but the one common theme among all of this is sort of incubating a new generation of leadership yeah. for Philadelphia, right? Can you talk about the genesis of that idea? Does it have, does it have to do with a critique of, of Philadelphia establishment, which historically has been a little uh, bureaucratic, shall we say? That's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, we, we've talked about this topic hundreds of times, but, but Philadelphia um, in many ways actually uh, is a lot like India. In, in, that, in the sense that a handful of toll keepers decide the flow of commerce and ideas uh, and it's, it's the, all of the power is concentrated in the hands of a, uh, uh, with just a few hands, but it, the decisions and policies and, and things that they make impact the rest of the area. In Philadelphia there is a different culture than Silicon Valley, which I envy. In Philadelphia it's not the idea that matters, but uh, the creator of the idea. And because the toll keepers who control it in the status quo for good and bad reasons, because they want to control what they have started, they don't like new. They don't like fresh. They don't like uh, a different perspective. Uh, for example, if you are Mark Zuckerberg and you come up with an idea of Facebook, you walk up to Philadelphia, the first thing that people will do is you would ask the existing establishment about Mark Zuckerberg if they've heard of him and if the idea is good. And of course the people who are in power would have never heard about Mark Zuckerberg, will not understand what Facebook is, and would say, don't know him, first of all he doesn't even wear a suit, probably a nobody, let's reject it. Whereas in Silicon Valley, a new guy with a new perspective is like a magnet and everybody goes to that area. I think we don't have that luxury, and I think one of the reasons why uh, you see the demise of Philadelphia's greatness the way it was in the past has been because of that myopia. And I think a lot of it has to do with, we're not unique. If you look at post-industrial Rust Belt cities, whether it's Philadelphia, Detroit, Baltimore, or Chicago to some extent, uh, wherever, uh, if, in all the places where there is uh, a multitude of diversity and ethnicity, uh, when you have the, when it's not a, a homogenous society, where you have gaps or disparities between wealth, where you have the strong labor unions, whether good or bad, whether you have ward leadership, whether you have entrenched one-party leadership, whether it's Republican or Democrat, doesn't matter. When you have all of that, you create this sort of hierarchy of ideas and you require a tollkeeper to sort of vet and process. And I think what we're doing, um, you being a big champion of that, is to disrupt that, to dilute the influence of the insiders and to exfoliate old thoughts and to allow regeneration of, of, uh, of new ideas and new people and empower them uh, and not just um, be hostage to uh, old. Well, you are certainly new and fresh and bold, so thank you for sharing these thoughts. Appreciate it, man. Thank you, and, and I, I have to, um, let me, uh, I, I know Benki is anxious to feed you guys, but let me, let me just uh, um, uh, tell you how, uh, what an honor it is. Uh, to be among family. Um, it, is, it is nice to be honored. It's the greatest compliment when people say good things about you and, 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 uh, and are proud of you. Um, and I, I have to tell you that every time somebody says a compliment, it, you know, I do somersaults inside. Um, so it is, it, it is obviously a, a great exercise in narcissism when people, people, people honor you. But there's nothing like being honored at the dinner table. It is almost as though I'm sitting at, at my house and my family members are honoring me, people who look just like me. And I, that, that doesn't happen often for me, believe it or not. So uh, it means a lot. And to many of you, uh, obviously, um, um, uh, have done a lot more than I have done in terms of philanthropy or public service. So it is ironic that I'm sitting here, not you on this side, but I'm grateful for this opportunity. And I'm uh, really proud that I met few of you and have learned about your philanthropy and your service. And I look forward to learning more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nairi. Thank you, Ajay.